This is unit eight, and we'll be discussing biomes in this unit. So it covers competency 3A. Uh, we're gonna compare and contrast the characteristics of the world's major biomes, including plant and animal species, climate, and adaptations. The earth can be divided into three climate zones. The climate zones have varying climates depending on the rainfall and the temperature. Uh, the climate is not just determined by the weather. The amount of sunlight that a zone receives is what determines which zone it's in. So you can see that the polar regions are on either pole of the earth. Um, those receive little direct sunlight. The temperate zones are next. Uh, those receive angled sunlight depending on the angle of the earth on its axis. And the tropical zone is around the equator. So that receives the most direct sunlight of any region on earth. Biomes are the different ecosystems on Earth. They're determined by their latitude, precipitation, and temperature. They're also characterized by specific abiotic and biotic factors. Abiotic factors are any non-living elements within the ecosystem, and then biotic factors are all living organisms within that environment. Abiotic fa factors can include climate, which is the year after year pattern of temperature and precipitation. Abiotic factors are on the left side of that picture. So sunlight, water cycling through the atmosphere, uh, currents, things like that are considered abiotic. Biotic factors are any living organisms within that environment. Those are on the right side of that picture. Animals, plants, decomposers, bacteria, anything that's alive or considered a living organism. Plants and animals are the biotic factors that are found in a biome. And plants and animals fit into a certain space within that biome. That's called the niche. So each species plays a certain role in its environment. So any interactions that it has with its environment, including where it lives, how it mates, uh, the food source that it has, determines the niche that it falls into. Uh, Plants and animals have certain adaptations that allow them to live in these biomes. And an adaptation is anything that increases an organism's chance of survival. You can see from the picture, there are several different wading birds. So this would be within a specific biome in a certain area, which would be near the beach or near a body of water. And each one of these birds occupies a certain space. So in this case, we're looking at its niche based on its food source. So for example, the flamingo has adaptations that allow it to wade deeper in the water and to look for its food source, whereas the oyster catcher has a little bit longer legs, not as long as the flamingos, but longer than the plovers. So it can occupy a different range and look for a different food source. Index animals can give you an idea of what biome you're actually in. So based on the adaptations that those animals have um, can be an indication of where the biome is. So for example, a polar bear would be found in the tundra biome because it has large amounts of fat and heavy fur to protect it from the cold. Whereas something like a road runner would be found in the desert because of the adaptations that it has. Different adaptations can include migration or hibernation. Those are to avoid harsh winters. They can be camouflaged, like the picture of the rattlesnake there that would be indicative of the desert biome. Uh, other animals would hunt or graze at specific times of day. Uh, so for example, desert animals would come out more at night because they would want to avoid the hot temperatures. Thick layers of fat and fur in cold climates, and then large extremities. The hair, for example, that you can see in the other picture, has large ears. That's not only so that it can hear predators coming, but that's so that its body can release more heat so that it doesn't overheat and get too hot in the desert or the grasslands.
Adaptations of plants are also uh, evident in biomes. So for example, uh, some plants have large thorns that would protect the stems and leaves. There are climbing vines in tropical rainforests so that those plants can reach the sunlight. Uh, there's also what's called a climax plant. So it's similar to index animals. The climax plants are determined by the climate of the biome. This shows the main biomes in the world. Um, this is just a world map. And you can see at the bottom there are color coded. So for example, uh, we're not gonna go too much into this, but this map shows the ice sheet and polar deserts in white. So that would be uh, the Arctic and Antarctica. Remember that biomes are determined by latitude. That's one of the determining factors. And you can see that red line. Uh, that is to indicate the equator. So based on the latitude around the equator, and remember that's the tropical zone, tropical rainforests are mainly going to be located around that tropical zone. The latitude and the climate determines the biome. So these are going to be areas that receive more direct sunlight and they're going to have more sunlight available during the day. So that sunlight availability and the amount of rainfall is going to determine what types of plants and animals can exist in that biome. This next map shows climatographs, uh, which we're discussing a little bit in class and you're working on for your biomes project. So we have a world map and then we have some of these graphs that indicate the rainfall and the temperatures throughout the year. So these will show usually the name of the city or the country where the data was collected. It'll show the months of the year at the bottom of that graph, so January, February, March, etc. Then on one side of the graph, it's going to indicate the temperatures. So these are usually going to be in degrees Celsius. Then on the other side of the graph, it's going to indicate the amount of rainfall. Um, in this case, we have millimeters. So for example, on this graph, we have Indola, which is in Zimbabwe. It's a subtropical biome in Africa. So that's where it's located. And you can see from that graph that the average temperature, if you take the temperature that was recorded year round, the average temperature is about 69 degrees Fahrenheit, which is indicated by the bars. And then we have average rainfall is about 49 inches. So you just look at that blue line there. And that would be the average for the year. That's not the average for the month. This next diagram is called a Whitaker diagram. And this kind of just lumps all of the biomes together but it shows you the different ranges of temperature and precipitation. So you can see the tundra biome receives the least amount of precipitation and it has a very low average temperature. The tropical rainforest on the other hand receives a good amount of precipitation and this precipitation is shown in centimeters. Temperature again is shown in degrees Celsius. So the tropical rainforest has warmer temperatures and the highest amount of rainfall. So let's talk about the different biomes. The first one is the tropical rainforest. Um, this is one of the most easily recognizable ones. Biotic factors within the rainforest include tall trees that would form a canopy. Those, that canopy forms a dense covering, so it doesn't allow very much sunlight to get through the canopy. The stems sometimes have thick, sharp thorns to protect from predators. Molds grow very well because the understory, which is below the canopy, 
is dark and wet. Animals have adaptations for climbing. They have to get up high in order to get food sources usually. And then canopy foragers eat fruits and nuts that are found high up in the trees. Abiotic factors, uh, it's usually hot and wet year round. The soil is very thin and it doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it. And you can see that climatograph is from Manassas, Brazil. So you can see the average rainfall and the average temperatures. In tropical forests, it's never winter and the trees are in leaf throughout the year. If a plant sitting on the ground beneath such a permanent canopy as this needs sunshine, it will have to climb to get it. These youngsters search for some kind of ladder by lashing around with their whip-like tendrils. Once one of them gets a grip, it puts a coil in the tendril, so shortening it and pulling itself closer to the branch up which it might climb. Other plants ascend by twining their main stem around their support. As a climber gets nearer the canopy and the light, it expands its leaves. There are no more determined competitors in this upward scramble than the rattans that live in the forests of Southeast Asia and tropical Australia. A mature rattan produces the longest stem of any plant. One has been measured at 560 feet. The mature plant doesn't develop leaves on its stem down here on the forest floor. It only does that up in the canopy. This luxuriant growth, basking in the full sunshine 200 feet above the ground, is the crown of the rattan, and it makes the plant's character quite plain. It's a kind of palm. The tendrils with which it climbs are so thin they are easily overlooked. But snag one of these on your arm and it will rip your clothes and your flesh. The tendrils are rigid enough to reach up and hook onto the branches of established trees. They then hold the stouter, heavier main stem in position while it grows upwards from the fearsomely protected bud at its tip. Next up we have grasslands. So some abiotic factors of grasslands are, include the subtropical climate. There are frequent brush fires in the areas. There are periods of drought where there's little to no rainfall. Warm summers and cold winters. So you can see from the map up at the top, much of the Western United States is considered to be grasslands. Biotic factors of the grasslands are plants with very deep tap roots because of the periods of drought. So those plants have to be able to reach water that's below the water table. Uh, their seeds can handle extreme heat. That's because of the frequent brush fires. And then grazing animals such as bison or antelope. Deserts biotic factors include plants that are able to store water. So those are adapted, adapted for the dry conditions. 
The plants usually have few leaves, that's to minimize water loss. So remember, transpiration is the way that plants lose water. So these plants have adapted to have these spines on them instead of leaves so that it reduces the amount of water that they lose. Biotic factors of animals in the desert are that they are nocturnal, so that's to minimize water loss during the day. Animals that burrow quite, quite frequently so they can avoid predators since there's not very much uh, vegetation to hide under. Large ears to regulate body heat, you can see on that fox there. And then the ability to store excess water in fatty tissues. Next is tundra. So some biotic factors of animals in the tundra biome are that animals migrate and they have small extremities as opposed to the animals in the desert. This is to reduce heat loss. And then camouflage that changes with the seasons. So we have that Arctic fox on the left would be in the summertime. So its fur is brown so that it can camouflage. And then when the snow starts to fall, its fur changes to white so that it can still camouflage and hunt. Plants in the tundra are usually small and stunted. So there is a layer of subsoil that is frozen. It's called permafrost. So because that permafrost freezes and thaws, it damages the roots of the plants. So they're usually small, they don't grow very large because the soil doesn't have a lot of nutrients and there's very limited sunlight. There's also high winds in those areas, so they grow low to the ground so that they don't fall over. The taiga biome can also be called the boreal forest. Abiotic factors are that they have bitter cold winters with heavy snow and then short summers that are not very hot. Biotic factors, the adaptations that animals use to keep warm, heavy fur and fat. And then for plants, there are dense forests of conifers, which are the cone-bearing trees. The cones and the needles are good for not collecting snow, so that the snow just falls right off of them. This also reduces the water loss, similar to the adaptation of the desert plants that have the needles to reduce water loss as well. Then we have temperate forests. Abiotic factors, cold winters and year-round rain. And then biotic factors include deciduous trees, so those trees lose their leaves when the seasons change. And then animals migrate or hibernate. You can see that Mississippi is in the temperate forest biome. The earth is covered by a variety of regions of characteristic vegetation called biomes. Examples of biomes include tropical rainforests, like those found in the Amazon basin and northeastern Australia the temperate deciduous forests of Europe and the eastern United States, the coniferous forests or taiga that span much of northern Europe and Canada, grasslands like those that once covered much of the central United States, the African savanna that supports some of the Earth's great populations of herbivores and large predators, chaparral found along coastal areas in places like California and the southern tip of Africa, tundra that covers much of the land near the Arctic Circle and the upper slopes of mountain ranges, and deserts like the Namib along the southern African coast and the Sonoran of the American Southwest. All living organisms, no matter which biome they live in, require four basic resources in order to survive. Nutrients from which to construct living tissue, energy to power that construction, liquid water to serve as the medium in which the reactions that build living tissue occur and temperatures appropriate to carrying out life processes. Nutrient levels sufficient to support life are found in most of the Earth's surface strata, as is witnessed by the taiga and grasslands that cover what was once the bare rock left by receding glaciers and the lush paradises that exist on islands 
formed by the lava flows of volcanoes. Likewise, sunlight, which is the initial source energy for all terrestrial biomes, is available in adequate quantities in most biomes at least part of the year. However, the other two requirements of life, liquid water and temperatures appropriate to carrying out life processes, are unevenly distributed on the Earth's surface. For example, liquid water is much more readily available throughout the year in tropical rainforests than in the Earth's desert communities. Likewise, temperatures appropriate to carrying out life processes exist throughout the year on the African savanna, while on the alpine or arctic tundra, appropriate temperatures may be reached for only five months a year, and even then may be much lower than those of the savanna. Thus, it is largely the availability of liquid water and temperatures appropriate to carrying out life processes that sets limits on the amount and types of organisms that can exist within a given biome. In deserts, for example, plant and animal life is sparse due to the limited availability of water, and though the species inhabiting any of the Earth's great deserts may differ, they all have adaptations that enable them to deal with extreme heat and drought. Likewise, all the species living on the tundra have adaptations to deal with extremely cold, harsh winters, short growing seasons, and the layer of permanent frost that lies in the soil right below them, even in the summer. The major factor affecting the distribution of water on the Earth's land surfaces and average temperatures at various locations on the globe is climate. Let's now look at the forces that shape the Earth's climate and then at the different biomes that are created as a result of climatic variations around the world. 